our education is geared more for the alternative investors, the ones that are investing in real estate, notes secured by real estate, investments into apartment buildings, commercial property, really anything that's outside of the stock market. If you're an investor looking to minimize the taxation that you pay on your investments, one of the greatest ways to do that is to understand how self-directed IRAs work. And that's what Newview Trust Company provides for investors of all types. Uh, today, we have a very special guest, uh, which will have come on in a second, who is uh, not only familiar with self-directed IRAs, but familiar with real estate investing. He is a real estate entrepreneur. He teaches a lot of classes here locally uh, in Central Florida. Uh, most people in Central Florida know him by name. Uh, so we can't wait to hear his story about how self-directed IRAs changed his life when it is looking at his overall retirement portfolio. So let's just jump in uh, to a couple of slides here just to introduce Newview Trust Company for anybody who is new. Um, Newview Trust Company is a licensed and bonded trust company that administrates retirement accounts, or in other words, IRAs. Our IRAs work a little different than an IRA at Fidelity or Charles Schwab, however. Most people have their retirement accounts with a Fidelity or Charles Schwab or a licensed securities brokers uh, that allows them to invest in stocks, bonds, mutual funds, and CDs. Uh, those are what we call traditional investments. Most people don't realize that you can have an IRA that holds non-traditional investments as well. Real estate's probably the biggest non-traditional investment people choose uh, when it comes to investing. Uh, but most people don't realize that real estate can be owned inside of a retirement account. And why would you want to do that? Uh, first, to understand how you do it, you first have to understand this term. It's called self-directed IRA. An IRA, it, it, but general rule of thumb is, is no different than uh, an IRA at Fidelity or an IRA at Newview Trust Company. We're all governed by the same set of rules. But when you hear that term self-directed, it's not a legal term. All it is, it's a marketing term that indicates you have more control over your investment options. At Newview Trust Company, you can have an IRA with us, but we don't sell investments to our clients. Our clients have free range to invest in whatever they want, but they work through us as the custodian in order to uh, purchase that investment in their retirement account or in their IRA. Uh, we have uh, the same IRAs you would have at other custodians, and I'll go over those types of IRA in a second. Um, but in order to under really understand the, the true benefit of self-direction, you got to understand what people use Newview Trust Company for. One is if you just want to diversify your overall investment portfolio. If you feel like you are too heavily invested in paper assets or stock stocks or mutual funds, and maybe it is that you just feel more comfortable investing in things like real estate. Well, a self-directed IRA, one that allows you to hold alternative assets like the ones here at Newview, give you the best opportunity to have true diversification. Uh, you can invest with Fidelity for your stocks and bonds. You can invest with Newview for your real estate. That's how most clients use self-directed IRAs. We're just a, a vehicle for them to hold non-traditional investments in their retirement portfolio. But the biggest thing that self-directed IRAs or just IRAs give us is tax savings. Tax savings are critical for those of us who are trying to save money for either for retirement, save money to pay for our current needs like healthcare or education expenses, but if you are an investor, the most important thing to learn is not about how to make more money, but how to keep more money. And one of the ways to keep more of your profit is to understand how to utilize self-directed IRAs, self-directed HSAs, self-directed ESAs. There's a long list of self-directed accounts that we have just here at Newview Trust Company that allow you to either minimize or eliminate taxation. And that's really the power uh, in these workshops is teaching people not only what you can invest in, but what types of tax advantages you get by using an IRA or in any of these plans that you see here. We have seven types of plans that can be self-directed here at Newview Trust Company. Roth IRAs, traditional IRAs are just your personal plans that we have here at Newview Trust. If you're self-employed, you have additional options for self-direction. You can use a SEP IRA or even a solo 401k or even a simple IRA that can be self-directed and you can invest in real estate directly through these accounts. And we also have non-IRAs, which are always a good topic of discussion, which would be your health savings accounts and education savings accounts. 
Those are non IRAs they are not retirement accounts, but they are tax shelters in which you can put money in. You can make investments within those accounts through NewView. Those investments can be into real estate, but the profit can be taken out immediately to pay for your family's health expenses with tax-free dollars or education expenses for your kids and grandkids with tax-free dollars. So when you step back and you look at these plans, airplane view, uh, just realize all of these plans that you see here are considered tax-exempt trusts or tax-exempt vehicles that you can minimize or eliminate taxation. And all of them can be used either individually or jointly to invest in things like real estate. Now, why would you want to invest in real estate in these types of accounts? Well, there's a lot of arguments that real estate is the largest segment of our economy. So why wouldn't you want to have some form of real estate investment in your overall portfolio? Other reasons why real estate is such a, a hot commodity, I would say, for an investment inside of an IRA is the fact that it's tangible. Tangible investments are, are critical, I would say. If you're looking at your investment portfolio, you don't want to have 100% of your assets as non-tangible assets. Uh, IRAs that own real estate offer the ability to hold tangible assets, assets you can drive by, you can touch, and you can feel. And if you talk to very successful real estate investors, they'll tell you all the different strategies that can be used with real estate to increase your cash flow, to increase appreciation, on your assets. There's just so many benefits that come with real estate. And when you can marry real estate with tax exemption or tax exempt status in an IRA, well, I, I will tell you, I've seen a lot of clients find that there's light at the end of the tunnel when it comes to their retirement assets. And a great example of that is our guest today, uh, who is Mr. Greg Bond, uh, who we'll bring on here in a second. Um, but it's not just real estate that you can invest in. Here's kind of a list of the investments that we see most commonly at Newview Trust Company. Uh, you can see all types of real estate assets can be held in the self-directed accounts that we have here at Newview, whether that's foreclosure uh, uh, properties, you're buying at foreclosures or trust auctions, tax liens, uh, apartment buildings, uh, real estate options is a, is a real creative investment uh, strategy that investors use through their self-directed IRAs. Uh, investing in the condominiums, even land, commercial property, or you can be more passive uh, with your investment decisions. I actually like to do notes. I, I, I do hard money loans out of my self-directed accounts because I don't have time to deal with toilets and tenants, but I know a lot of real estate investors that uh, enjoy dealing with toilets and tenants, and I put my money in their hands and I'm secured like a bank is uh, by the property. That's a, a strategy a lot of our new view clients like to use. Or you can be passive in other regards where maybe so you meet somebody who's an investment sponsor and they're buying an apartment building and they're forming a syndication and they're raising money to, to buy these uh, large assets. Uh, we have a lot of clients that use their IRAs to invest in, in larger projects uh, that are managed by other individuals. When you look at the IRS code as to what we're allowed to invest in, it, they don't restrict us as to what we're allowed to invest in. They only tell us we're not allowed to invest in two things. The only two things you can't own in an IRA our life insurance contracts and collectibles. Anything else is fair game. So if somebody tells you you cannot own real estate in an IRA, they don't understand the rules or they're just trying to prevent you from investing in something that they don't make money on. So large amount of investment options. When you have an account at NewView, we don't restrict you uh, other than the two things I mentioned there. Uh, so our clients have free range to invest in the things they're knowledgeable about. And I will tell you uh, that knowing uh, Mr. Greg Bond, I will tell you that he's very, very knowledgeable in real estate and uh, also additionally, very knowledgeable about self-directed IRAs. Uh, Greg, are you, are you with us? Go ahead and unmute yourself. I'm here, Nate. How are you doing today, sir? Thank you for doing, joining us. Doing great. Uh, I will tell you just a, a little bit of, uh, to the audience uh, how I've come to know Greg is Obviously, he's a phenomenal real estate investor. He's a good friend uh, of Newview Trust Company, good friend of our owner, Glenn Mather. As you see there, he's got his dartboard there over his uh, left shoulder. <laughs> and I will tell you, it is, it is, I knew Greg Bond prior to even knowing Greg Bond because there's a similar dartboard in Glenn's office with Greg's face on it. So I saw Greg's face on a dartboard before I ever saw it in real life. <laughs> uh, but we, we appreciate, yeah, we appreciate you joining us. I I'll also say this, uh, if you, if you attended our investor retreat just this past January, Greg was one of our day one speakers and, and knocked it out of the park talking from his experience 
about how self-directed IRAs changed his life and, uh, and specifically with, with the ability to put real estate investments in his self-directed IRA. So, so Greg, welcome. Uh, tell the audience a little bit about yourself and, and why you're here today. Yeah, Nate, uh, I just, uh, I want to share, I, I think uh, what I'm, uh, you know, what I'm doing, most anybody can do uh, with a little bit of time and effort. If you want to just kind of go over some of the, the things that, um, you know, that now I'll just say this, you teach some classes about self-directed IRAs and, and there's a lot yes. of advantages. Maybe you can just start by telling uh, the audience kind of how you found self-direction and, and what, you, what you like to invest in most these days. Yeah, I, Nate, I, I found it because I was looking for, um, in 2008-9, I was looking for funds. I couldn't, I ran out of cash, couldn't get loans from banks, everything was locked down. Um, and somebody said, well, you can use your retirement funds. And I thought, uh, how's that work? So I'd come to probably five or six different New View mixers. Um, it was obviously before Zoom and, and uh, podcasts were a thing. So I, I'd come and meet with people or meet people, talk to people, hear what they were doing. And I always walked away with it kind of like, ah, I don't know if they're, if this is quite legal. And uh, it took me about six months and I came to um, an event and Jason uh, DeBono was there. And Jason said, Greg, I see uh, you're back again. Welcome back. Uh, but he said, I can also see I checked and you've never opened an account with us and you've been hanging around a long time. What's, what's going on? And I said, well, Jason, I honestly, I don't know if this is really legal. And he kind of chuckled and he said, have you looked at the IRS code? Uh, and I said, I didn't even know there was IRS code surrounding this. So he, uh, he sent me the IRS code. I looked at it. I said, my goodness, this is real. I can actually do this. This, it almost seems like it should be illegal, right? Because it's, it's so great but there's yet there's so many people that don't know about it and it's just amazing to me that people don't know about self-direction right you walk down the street and say do you know about self-directed iras oh yeah i'm self-directed i can buy any stock bond or mutual fund i want no it's not and you talk to some accountants and they say well we don't really know if you want to do that that might not be in your best interest and you just walk away going my gosh these people just really do not understand the power of what this uh, what this allows you to be able to do so yeah well i'll say this i found self direction in a similar fashion you know when i started working in the industry i i thought the same thing is this legal uh, because i've never heard of this so the, the you you kind of go back to your uh, you know thinking how come nobody's taught me this you know i went to college i went to mba program um, i was in real estate i I, I had my real estate license at one point. I, I even, uh, you know, spent 10 years as a residential loan officer doing financing for people. And no, never once did I ever hear about a self-direction or the ability yep. to lend out of an IRA, buy real estate in an IRA. I thought that you were just allowed to buy stocks and bonds. And it, it took me a couple of weeks to wrap my head around it. And actually, and I did the same thing. I looked at the code and I said, oh, okay, well, these rules have been like this since 1975. And that's where I became passionate about it because I just thought everybody should know this. Whether you're a real estate investor or not, you should know what all of your options are. Right. And then you can you have so much more control over it. That was what was just amazing to me. I started out, Nate, I, I, I spent 20 years. We had a paper-based map company. And that uh, kind of blew up in 2008 as the economy took a tumble. Plus, uh, the iPhone started coming out with Google Earth and nobody wanted paper maps anymore. Uh, so I, I said, um, my goodness, what, what am I going to do? And that's, you know, when I started buying real estate, but I had had 20 years of a 401k plan in our company. And I thought, well, I know I've got about 200,000 there. And when I finally started opening up my latest statements and seeing that that 200,000 had turned into 58,000, I was a little dis, uh, disheartened to see um, how much of a, a haircut I had taken uh, in 2008 on that, uh, you know, on my stocks that I picked. And I, I don't, can't even tell you what I picked. It, somebody yeah, told me, yeah. put it in this. And I did because retirement's a long way off and it really didn't matter. It was going to grow. And, and I just looked at 58,000 and I thought, oh my goodness, how, how am I going to recover from this? Right. Yeah. Um, but your 401k um, turned into a 201k. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Less, happens, less than a 201k. Less 101k. Than a 201K. Yeah. Um, 
you know, I'd like to hear what, what was your first investment like with self-directed IRAs? How did how did that go? If you were if you're talking to somebody who maybe is in that same position you were in, yeah. they're they've been kind of thinking about it, they've been reading some stuff about it, maybe they watched a podcast here or there, but they haven't really got started. What would be kind of your advice, or maybe even walk someone through maybe that first investment you did with a self-directed IRA? Yeah, well, I'll talk a little about the first one I did. It was actually an auction. I went to an auction house, bid on a property, won the auction. Um, and, uh, had, uh, I'd researched enough to know that I needed some money from my new view account. Right. So I had a cashier's check in hand because typically at an auction, you have to put 10% down. So I put that 10% down, closed that property in my IRA. Uh, it was, uh, about a $40,000 property. Um, it, uh, took about $5,000 in rehab and, uh, I, I rented out that property. And uh, shortly thereafter, well, I guess it was two years later, actually, I ended up selling that property for about a $24,000 profit. So I looked at it and said, you know, two years, I spent $45,000. I just, uh, well, I'd been getting rent all along that time as well. Um, so I've been getting roughly $500 a month in positive cash flow because I had no mortgage. So I had property taxes, insurance, other expenses going along with that. but. Um, all in all, about $500 a month. So I had accumulated about $12,000 in just rents. And uh, so $12,000 in rents and then a $24,000 gain on top of that was $36,000, of which I pay zero tax on a $45,000 investment. So you look at that return on investment and it's just, it's phenomenal. And I, I kind of scratched my head and said, wow, that's, that's so good. How do I do this again? And that's I think really what got me starting to analyze that first deal and going through it and saying, okay, how did I do this? What steps can I automate? Um, how do I push the next one through quicker? Because your return is all based on the, your timeframes, right? So I want to reduce those timeframes. And so the next one I did in six months and I made 36,000 on that one. But I, I developed a process and you've, you've heard me talk about it, but it's just buy two, hold one, sell one. So I would, I would wait until I received enough income that allowed me to buy two properties. So I'd accumulate cash, I'd put in my annual contributions. And once that cash started building up to the point, and then my rent's going in as well, once that started building up to a, to a certain level, and I kind of know the real estate market, I'd know, okay, I need, again, 2008, 9, 10, right? Those time frames, prices were a whole, a whole lot lower. But this same thing applies to what, whatever you're trying to do. So I would wait till I had about $100,000 accumulated in cash, or that I would have with the sale of one of the properties, I'd have $100,000 and then I could go in and buy two. And then I'd fix them up, rent them out, hold one and sell the other as soon as I can generate another 100,000. You know, it doesn't have to work specifically for real estate. This concept works for, I've got an aunt that, that uh, sells uh, knitting looms, you know, these big things that, yeah. you know, they take up a whole room, right? Yeah. When yeah. people get them, they love it. It's best day in the world is when they get their knitting loom. And then all of a sudden, three years go by and they don't use it and it's taken up the whole room and they can't use it for anything else. They're ready to get rid of that knitting loom, right? And, and so she can buy them for $500 and turn around and sell them for $2,500, right? So it, anything that you can buy, woodworking equipment, again, things that people tend to really get into, and then all of a sudden, you know, they're not into it anymore, and it kind of sits there and takes up space, and you go, if I can kind of specialize in this area and, and start flipping knitting looms or start flipping woodworking equipment or start flipping whatever your expertise is, Right. And that's that's the beauty of the self-direction that you spoke of is you use your expertise to really control the outcome or not totally control, but but give you more certainty of outcome with in an area that you actually have knowledge base in and you have an understanding in. So it's I happen to do real estate, but it can be applied to absolutely anything, um, you know, that, that you're into. If it's it cars, is it knitting looms? Is it woodworking equipment? Is it airplanes? Is it horses? Is it whatever it, whatever it is? Um, that's, that's just the beauty of it. And 
Yeah, uh, you, you, you basically can take, you apply your knowledge to the investments. And, um, you know, there's a lot of people that I would say, they, there's always some, you know, people that have some misconceptions about owning real estate uh, in an IRA. I, I know one of them, uh, you know, depending on who you talk to, they might ask questions uh, like, why would you buy real estate in an IRA? Because you don't get depreciation. That's, that's one thing that you often hear from maybe CPAs yes. or people because they're so focused on the depreciation benefit that somebody gets investing in real estate personally, that they think it's not a good idea in an IRA. And you do a phenomenal job breaking down what the tax benefits are. Um, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about to that? Yeah, I wish I, I wish I could get my PowerPoint up because I've got it very yeah. done, done very nicely in an example in a PowerPoint. But yeah, I've, I've heard a, a, a large amount of people say, yeah, I just don't want to do that deal because I don't get depreciation. And to me, that's a little short sighted because depreciation is only one part of the overall equation. Right. You've got your cash flow. And you've got your depreciation. Those two give you your annual annualized return. But then below that, you've got amortization. So especially if you're if you're leveraging at all um, in in your IRA, which I would, you know, depending on your your risk tolerance, I would I would recommend that. Um, and then you've got your appreciation, which especially in Central Florida right now is a huge huge contributor to your overall return on investment. So once you take those four things into play and you look at it and say, well, I'm going to take my depreciation out, that still gives you cash flow. If you're leveraging, still gives you amortization and still gives you the most important and, and probably the largest is your appreciation. So when you compare that to an investment that you get some depreciation on, you know, maybe it's going to be three or 4%, but if that return is 25% and you're losing three or 4%, you still got a 21% return. I mean, in, in real estate for, for my particular case, I've been able to average about a 34% a annualized return since 2009 in real estate. Now, I've been able to hand pick a lot of those, right? And I'm constantly looking for the opportunity where there's a huge gain to basically harvest that gain inside my IRA to eliminate the tax uh, consequences of that particular investment. So a couple of other things I wanted to ask you too, since, since you have a lot of experience using IRAs to, to buy and sell real estate. And, and yes. I, while you're talking, I'm going to bring up a slide um, that kind of shows the process. If you can bring that up, Grace, there's a slide that we have to show the process. And the reason I want to have this up there is kind of a, just a, an image that people can kind of follow through. And maybe you can touch on some of the procedural things of taking you know, an IRA from say a Fidelity or Charles Schwab and bringing it over and, and, and actually making an offer on the property. Can you talk a little bit about to somebody who's new, who hasn't done this before, and maybe even talk about the types of IRAs you like to use and why when it comes to the tax benefits to the certain ones you use? Yeah, a a absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, the, the new, new view staff has been great, Scott, you know, to get things transferred over. Typically, you're talking about two weeks from transferring from a Fidelity or you know whatever account uh, you're currently holding your your uh, retirement funds in, about two weeks to get it into NewView before you have access to it within the NewView system. So you know that that process you want to give enough time to be to to allow the funds to become available, and then it's just a matter of filling out some paperwork, uh, which uh, in the it's like anything you know initially it's it's cumbersome it's you don't understand it but. Really, it, it gets pretty simple once you do it once or twice and you say, great, I got to fill out this paperwork to basically inform new of you what you want them to do with your money, right? Because you're the driver. And so it's filling out those forms, getting those forms to new view, and then them funding whatever project or real estate or whatever you're purchasing. And um, it's it pretty simple, easy process to go through. New view then signs for you in the case of a closing. I don't sign it because I don't own the property. My IRA through NewView owns the property. So NewView Trust comes in and signs all of the documents. I obviously have to look them over, review them, make sure everything's okay. So NewView sends me a DocuSign document where I look over all the documents, make sure it's okay, initial each page. Uh, via DocuSign, it goes back to NewView. They know I reviewed it now. They then know it's okay to close and send a wire out or a check or whatever the, uh, however the agreement is for that particular asset that you're purchasing. 
and now you own that property or that asset inside your um, self-directed uh, IRA. I personally prefer Roth. And I've, again, I've had this with this discussion with many people that they say, I don't want to pay the tax right now. I want to get a tax deduction on my, on my tax return. So I don't have to pay the tax now. I'm going to wait until I retire. And obviously, I'm going to be in a lower tax bracket at that point. And the tax bracket's going to be lower than I am right now. So I'll pay less tax if I just push that off to the future. And to me, that I don't agree with that line of reasoning. Um, as a real estate investor, I would hope that everybody's uh, goal is to make more money in retirement from their passive income than they ever made during their working career. In that case, my income is going to be larger. I don't want anything from an IRA to add to my income to push me into a higher tax bracket. Now I'm paying more tax. So I'm a huge proponent of converting as much as possible to a Roth environment, whether that's a 401k Roth or a traditional uh, IRA Roth. I think that is the absolute way to go and to just get that tax burden put to the side and let that grow tax deferred. And then you never ever have to worry about paying tax again. I, so, I agree. I agree with you. And um, we're actually doing a, uh, a workshop this month about the mighty, mighty Roth IRA. And we, we talk a lot about that. Um, and I, I'm a, I, I thought the same thing, Greg, when I when I thought, you know, people want to defer their taxes to retirement until they're in a quote, lower tax bracket. The first thing I thought was, well, how do I know what tax bracket I'm going to be in, you know, 20 years down the road? And I don't want to live, I'd rather live my retirement in a, in a high tax bracket, personally, uh, being that I'm, I have money to spend, I don't want to live more frugally. Um, so when I looked at the Roth IRA, the ability to just eliminate taxation and not even worry about it in retirement was so attractive to me. Um, that again, I thought, how is this legal? Everybody should understand yes. how this Roth IRA works. And especially when you look at real estate, for example, and the thing I love about real estate is it's an income producing asset that not only can appreciate over time, but if it's in the right area, you get rents, you get all sorts of different income streams that you, that you can uh, have from it. And if you have enough of those types of assets owned in a Roth IRA, uh, that has what we call qualified distributions. And for anybody who's listening, qualified distributions for a Roth IRA typically get met when you have the Roth IRA open for five years and you're above the age of 59 and a half. Once you have that Roth IRA established in that way, you can take tax-free distributions out of the Roth IRA out of all the income generated in it and never have to pay taxes ever again. So if you have, if you multiply, if you've got 10 or 12 rental properties, and I know we have clients like this that have 10 or 12 rental properties owned in a Roth IRA, they're past 59 and a half. Every time a renter pays rent to their Roth IRA owned property, they just take the rent out to themselves as a monthly distribution and they're not taxed and they're not penalized. And they're also not forced to take required minimum distributions and start liquidating assets at age 72. So it's, it's not only a great way to, to give yourself in retirement some tax-free income on a monthly basis by holding real estate, but it's also a great way to preserve wealth and pass it on to the next generation. That, that's what I'm really looking at, Nate, is that way to pass that, that income tax-free to the next generation. So unfortunately, the SECURE Act came up right and now. You've got 10 years that they have to take it within a 10-year time frame, which really uh, upsets me, but nonetheless, it still works to pass that income to the next generation. So I'm hoping never to have to touch my income. I'm hoping my other investments will provide me with the, the retirement that I need and the, the funds that I need in retirement. And then that can just be a transfer uh, to, to my children at, at my, uh, my retire or at my death um, as, a, as a transfer tool. The, yeah. the thing is that, that I always like to talk about too is you know, if, if I transfer my kids, let's say I, have, I end up with $2 million in my accounts and it transfers to my kids. If they get a lump sum of a million dollars each, how's that going to affect their lives? Have you educated them um, to be able to handle that sort of money? You, you know, you look at all the lottery, lottery winners, right? And you go, what happens to them, right? Let's follow them from the day they won 
uh, to two years later and see where they're at. And most of them are in a worse position than when they were when they won the, the, the big lump sum money. And so it, it comes down to education and educating your kids along the way. And I wish that I would have been um, more aware of what I needed to do when my kids were young. Um, I did a lot of things wrong. I'm, I'm trying to make up for that. And I think my, my son has, you know, just blossomed and, and understands it all and gets it. And my daughter, um, she's in Australia. I don't have as much, you know, impact with her because of that distance. Uh, so, you know, I would be concerned on, on how that would affect her um, to, to leave, you know, lump sums of money like that to, to the next generation that hasn't been trained in money concepts and economy and, and that sort of thing. So, yeah, I, I agree with you. You know, most people who have large, you know, buckets of money held in, you know, stocks and bonds, if, when they pass away and that passes to the next generation, how easy is it for your kids, your grandkids to just press sell and, and cash out everything? Um, it, you know, unless you've educated them enough as to, you know, the value of those investments, a lot of people, if, if it's easy to sell, they're going to sell it. The thing I like about self-directed IRAs is not only can you uh, accumulate large amounts of wealth, um, but when you pass it on, you're passing on tangible investments that they, they were either, you know, you, you, you teach them as you're investing in it or what they're going to, you know, have in, 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 you know, through a beneficial IRA, but sometimes it just forces them to understand what to do with it. Oh, I, I have this retirement account. It's got six rental properties in it. You know, what do I do with this? And it's harder to, um, to just sell off six rental properties in the self-directed IRA. Could they squander the rents here and there? Sure. But you give them real tangible assets that are that are there. And I just think by by natural, you know, uh, they just figure out how, how to figure figure out how to manage those types of assets versus just selling a bunch of stock. Yeah. And, and I think there's there's so many different ways to make it an educational uh, process with kids fun. I mean, I just took both of our kids and my uh, my future daughter in law. Well, she's now she now is my daughter in law. But before my son got married. And we all went uh, in July of 2000 to Puerto Rico to a John Hire week-long event. And we just had a great time to Puerto Rico, spent time together, um, and, and then got educated at John Hire's event. And it's, you know, it, it really, being at that event all day long and then going out to eat dinner and going someplace or doing something together, it creates a lot of teachable moments in, in ways that, okay, I didn't quite understand what John said, right? And then you get to explain it a little bit more. And now they're interested and now they're, they're starting to understand a little bit more. So I think there's, you know, there's all sorts of ways to make that happen. You know, if a, a grandparent, you know, to, to a grandkid will pay you hundred dollars to listen to this podcast or to go on new view and listen to their, their podcast and, and tell me what you learned because I don't yeah. have time to do it. And, or waiting until they need something and saying, great, we'll pay for that. But, you know, I, I need you to do this for me. So I think there's it, just looking for those moments to me is one of the most important things in, in helping train that next generation and helping them understand, you know, what they can do. And I know uh, you've done a great job uh, <laughs> educating, not, you know, your family, but, but it, a lot of other people outside of your family through the CFRI meetings and all the things that you do. And I will say um, John Hire is a great resource. If anybody is interested uh, in learning from one of the best uh, tax attorneys and somebody that's a, a self-directed IRA expert, John Hire is a great, great person to listen to. So go, go search him, follow him. Uh, it's spelled H Y R. We actually hope to have him at our next investor retreat coming up in uh, July this summer. So hopefully he'll be one of our, our special guest speakers. Um, let's, I want to get back a little bit to the process um, so that, you know, the, our viewers can kind of relate from, from a client's perspective. Mm -hmm. You know, what are some of the things that you would suggest people um, look out for if they're interested in investing in real estate with their self-directed IRA? Maybe talk about some of the pitfalls or just some of the things that they need to consider hiring contractors, paying for expenses, kind of talk from the client's perspective on how you manage all that. Yeah, I think uh, a, a lot of it comes through um, finding somebody that is experienced in that area and kind of riding their coattails. I mean, I've had a lot of people come and say, Greg, you know, what do you think about this deal? And I'll tear it apart and they'll, they'll walk away with their tail between their legs because it's just not a deal they should do. On the other hand, I've seen quite a few deals that I said, yes, I would do that deal. That is, that is a wonderful opportunity and you should jump on that right away. So I think just vetting that through somebody with, with a certain level of experience, right? And saying, here's what I'm thinking and kind of let them guide you 
And, and Nate, also just understanding it's not a get rich quick scheme, right? So many people that I've talked to, oh, great. You, you know, you did it. I can do it. And I'm going to, I'm going to have a million dollars by next year. Well, that's, it's just not realistic, right? Having, being able to plan out, I think, I don't see a lot of people doing the planning portion of it. So it's, it's understanding what do I need for my retirement? How much am I going to need? And kind of backing into that and then saying, okay, I'm starting with $5,000, but I've got 30 years until retirement, right? How much do I want to retire with? And people struggle. And in fact, I'm going to be doing a class at CFRI on what's your number? You know, what number do you need to retire? Because people don't understand the process to go through to, to actually get to that number. So I'm developing a, um, some, some slides right now to be able to walk people through that and help with that process. But it's just, it, it's the planning and coming from the map industry, right? I want to go from point A to point B. How do you get there? Well, there's a million ways you can get there. You can go, the road goes in a straight line and the quickest, easiest way is to go in that straight line. Most people don't go in the straight line. Most people zigzag through and they come up and they go around and they backtrack and they come around and they finally get to the same, uh, the same result in the same location, but they just did it a different way and it took them a different amount of time. And that's pretty much everybody, right? Everybody's going to do it in a different time frame. Everybody's going to go a different direction. And there's really no right or wrong way as long as you can get to your goal by the time, right? I got I to gotta be at that location at 10 o'clock. Well, it's seven in the morning. It's half an hour there. I can stop and get a coffee. I can take a detour. I can do a lot of different things, you know, and still get there by 10 o'clock. And I think people need to do a little bit of planning. And, and this is not just individuals, but this is husband and wife together, right? Talking about what are our goals? What do we need to do? I think having a, a year plan, a five-year plan, a 10-year plan, and then, you know, you're kind of working your one-year plan and you're seeing that, how that's going to change your five-year plan, which changes your 10-year plan. And it's just in a constant state of, of revision, but you, you have some semblance of what you're trying to accomplish, where you're trying to go. And if, if you don't know where you're going, how do you know when you get there? Yeah. Right, so, Two, uh, you know, what, something I picked out of that is, is one, I, I like, I love the idea of reverse engineering your retirement, figure out where's your number. They used to have that commercial where they, the, the people threw out the tape or whatever. And, you know, how, how, how much is your number? Is it $2 million uh, that you have to have in a retirement? Is it 3 million? You know, what is your number? And then reverse engineer, figure out what investments uh, would get you there. Uh, the other thing, you know, you, you mentioned, which I think is so powerful, especially with self-directed IRAs and, and why some people are hesitant to, to do the first investment. I find that a lot of investors um, who are on the fence are waiting for the home run deal when they don't realize you don't need home run deals to get to, you know, a two, three, four, $5 million IRA. You just need a couple, a couple base hits and, and doubles score runs just as much as home runs do. Exactly. Yeah. Singles and doubles all day long. You're, you're, if you're doing that many singles and doubles, you're occasionally just by the law of averages, you're going to hit a home run, right? Yeah. You're going to hit a grand slam. Every once in a while, it's going to happen. But I don't think you should be out looking and not doing deals if it, you know, if you're not going to hit that home run or grand slam. 100% agree with that. It's, it's a lot of little investments over a long time. If you can sell six looms a year, that you bought for $500 and sell them for $1,500, you've now got another $1,000 profit for each one. It's another $6,000 in that account that you can now leverage that to do, do it with something else, right? So it's a, lot, a little bit over a long period of time helps you reach your goal. So how, I, I, how, have, your, how, how have your investments, um, I don't want to say matured, but how, how have they, uh, what's been the progression of your investments from that very first one that you did on a house that you found at auction and, you know, you're able to pick it up for 40 grand and it turned out to be a pretty good investment. How have your investments uh, progressed over time to what, what's the strategy look like today versus what it looked like back then? It's, it's somewhat the same. I mean, I'm still doing a lot, although I've, I've, I've graduated, right? So what I'm doing in my non IRA accounts is what I then try and do in my IRA accounts. If it works one place, it works the other place. So right now I'm taking, I'm what my, what my son Nick says is it, uh, it's a real game of monopoly, 
right? Mm -hmm. So I'm taking, I've got four paid off houses and say each one of those houses is worth 250,000, right? Because we've seen so much appreciation in the housing market right now that I never looked at my return on equity. I was always focused on my return on investment. And because I bought so low, my return on investment always looked pretty good. But when I start analyzing my return on equity, that's when I got a little bit disenchanted. And I said, my goodness, I've got so much equity setting there. What can I do? So right now we're playing a real game of Monopoly. We're selling four houses and then we're re-leveraging that money, right? So say if each one of them was 250,000 and so four houses is a million dollars. Well, a bank right now will give you a 75% loan to value. So if I have a million dollars, the bank will loan me $3 million. And now with my million dollars, I can buy a $4 million asset. That $4 million asset is going to throw off three to four times what I was making from those four single family homes, right? So I look at my cash flow and say, oh my goodness, I just tripled or quadrupled my cash flow. So again, I, I'm... You know, I'm 30 years down the road. So somebody that's just starting out, this isn't a strategy for them. It's a strategy for them to consider and, and understand because they will get there, right? And to just watch that return on equity and know when it's time to exit out of a property or re-leverage that property, put more, you know, put debt on that property to be able to use that income to buy something else. So yeah, and a lot of a lot of people don't realize because you, you're talking about leverage, you're talking about bank financing, um, and most people just associated to that with doing business outside of your IRA. Most people don't realize that your IRA can leverage bank financing. Your IRA can go out and get a loan. Um, your IRA can even if it if it owns a property free and clear, and you'd like to tap into some of that equity and redeploy it and get a, a new another property in your IRA. There's banks that will they'll give you the financing for that. Have you, have you gone down that route? Have you used uh, leverage in any of your uh, yeah, we, stories? We, yeah, we certainly did. And it uh, really, again, you look for the opportunities, right? So we had a particular opportunity where um, a, a couple was selling five duplexes in Winter Park. And uh, we, we said, my goodness, this, this is a great opportunity. They wanted $30,000. Well, my mind immediately goes to they want $30,000 a piece times five is $150,000. And I said, I don't have that much cash right now in my IRA. So how do we structure this to get them what they want? And, and I can also purchase the property. So I said, well, the, the first thing to know is get to know them and see what, they, what their needs are and how, how can I fulfill their needs? So the, we set up a lunch. It was just the wife that came to lunch and I later understood why. Um, but we, we went out to lunch, sat down, introduced ourselves, you know, small talk. And then we got into it. And I said, listen, I, uh, she told me, I said, what's going on in, in your life? Why are you selling these? And people had made her offers. And I think she'd had it out there for six weeks and everybody just made her offers, but she would not allow anybody to go inside the houses to do any inspections whatsoever. And you look at them from the outside and you can see deferred maintenance is there, right? Trees are growing, roofs you know, are, need to be replaced. And you just kind of go, what's happening? Well, come to find out what happened was her husband had cancer. Mm -hmm. And he, throughout their whole married life, he's the one that maintained the properties. He did all the maintenance. He put all the tenants in place. And now he was sick and couldn't do any of that. So it was falling back on her and she was scared if she let somebody to go look at in one of the properties and disturb the tenants at all that the tenants would leave and she didn't know how to put another tenant back in place. So she is just scared to death that she's going to lose those tenants because she doesn't know what to do. And so then I, I said, well, okay, I think I can help you out there, but you know, $30,000, would you consider taking any less? And she goes, she said, no, I really need $30,000 because I want to remodel my kitchen and my, my husband's you know, going through a little bit of remission and we want to take the grandkids and he on a Disney cruise. And I said, wait a minute, you just want 30,000? She said, yeah, just in total? Yes, it wasn't 150. It was $6,000 per unit ah. times five units for a total of 30. But had I not taken her out to lunch or tried to probe a little bit into what she needed. And it was, 
it's so much about what they need, not about what you need, right? And if you can fulfill what they need and you got a true win-win situation, that's what I love about telling the story. It's a true win-win. So we gave her the $30,000. We were able to buy them. Um, She gave them to us for 90,000 each with with an $84,000 note that she held back. So she held owner financing. Non and, just, and just to be clear, the, I, the IRA was the buyer and the IRA, the, it, the note was carried back to the IRA. Correct? Right. Because I looked at that and I said, this is too good of an opportunity. I can buy it outside of my IRA, but if I buy it inside my IRA, all those taxes go away, right? They just get eaten up and through, through the, the magic of, of self-directing your, your IRA. And so I said, I'm going to specifically buy these. We bought them. I didn't have enough money at that point. We bought them in my wife's. Mm -hmm. So we bought them in James IRA. And now all of a sudden, those properties are are worth probably 300,000 a piece. But what what happened, Nate was she gave me 5% on a 25 year amortization with a 10 year balloon on a recourse loan or non recourse loan into our IRA. We looked at it and the cash flow that those properties were throwing off allowed us to pay it at a straight 10 year amortization and still make a couple hundred dollars a month per property. So we, we bought them in our early Mm fifties and I said, my gosh, we can have these things paid off in our early sixties at retirement age. Mm -hmm. And so now five duplexes paid off each throwing off, you know, um, 1500 to $2,000 per side, Mm -hmm. $4,000 times five is $20,000 a month. Now that's before taxes, insurance, and maintenance, but let's say that eats up 5,000. So you're, so we're taking out or have the ability to take out $15,000 a month in retirement, all because of a conversation, right? And looking at a way to structure things inside the IRA, I could have, on the other hand, said, I'm going to buy these, turn around and sell them for 120, make $30,000 profit each one. And I'm going to put 150,000 in my pocket. I think that's short-sighted. Yeah. Right. So doing the IRA play allows me now to, to harvest that equity tax-free because they're in a Roth, in a Mm -hmm. Roth environment and throwing off $15,000 every month in retirement sure looks, sure looks a lot better than taking a one-time lump sum of 150 that I got to pay tax on. And that, I mean, that is a great story because a lot of people don't realize you don't need hundreds of thousands of dollars in an IRA to buy something like you just bought. It, it just takes a little bit of creativity, a little bit of understanding on how to structure deals, take maybe taking someone out to lunch that might help uh, getting down to the root of what they, what they really need. Um, but you nailed it on the head that, you know, I, I didn't want the cash now because it's real short-sighted. I, you know, I would pay taxes on it and yada, 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 and sure I could have invested in something else. But if I do it outside of my IRA, that money's always going to be taxable. I'm just rotating money and and Uncle Sam is my silent partner every time I do it. Um, Having some investments in your IRA is going to eliminate Uncle Sam from uh, reaching into that pocket. Now, I will say there's probably some people, some of our more uh, advanced, experienced listeners are probably thinking, well, what about UBIT? What about UDFI? Isn't that a, isn't that a debt leveraged investment? You know, and and me being the IRA nerd, I already picked out, you know, some, some helpful tips because I, I, I know how the strategy works and that buying and holding a property that's debt leveraged and getting the note paid off definitely adds, uh, you know, a, a success story on the end there. You want to talk a little bit about that piece yeah, of it without yeah. getting too much in the weeds? Yeah. Well, we, you know, we've had, it's a, it's a form 99T that we have to fill out every year with our tax returns. Right. And they basically say, okay, let's figure out this investment as if it was not in your IRA. So you get to take figuring your depreciation, all your expenses. And they say, okay, you're, you're now, you made X amount of dollars. Well, once I take the depreciation off for the past seven years, I've made $0. Mm-hmm. So I've paid zero tax throughout this whole time. And I have, I have to, yeah, I have to fill out the form. It's a pain to fill out the form, but you know what, for the benefit I'm receiving, it's very, very little uh, to actually get the type of benefit you're receiving. So I wouldn't let that, that type of, you know, the UBIT uh, affect my decision-making in buying a leveraged property. I would, I want to leverage as much as I can. Anytime I hear owner financing, I think, I mean, I want to put it in my IRA. 
Yeah. And, and so just to give one. a little foundation for people, um, you know, because you mentioned depreciation. Now, earlier in the, sh in the program, we talked about, well, mm -hmm. normally in, in the IRA world, if you're buying a property all cash and there's no debt, you don't have you don't get a depreciation because it's a mute point. Right. There's yep. no tax to depreciate against. So the whole purpose of using your IRA is that you're just eliminating the tax. There's no capital gains tax. There's nothing to depreciate against unless you put your IRA into a position where it becomes a taxpayer. One of the most common uh, scenarios or investment strategies that can do this is when your IRA buys debt leverage property, whether it buys a property that already has debt on it, buys property that you're putting debt on it through the ca carrying back a note, or it's buying property and it's getting help by getting financing from a bank. Those are all scenarios where you might have debt on a property owned by your IRA. In the eyes of the IRS, the IRS just wants to tax the portion that's borrowed, not the portion your IRA puts up, the portion that's borrowed. So some people get this knee jerk reaction. They say, well, I thought the whole purpose of using my IRA was to avoid tax. Yes, it, there, it, there is that point, but when you're, you, when you're looking at the leverage piece of it, is it giving you an advantage that you didn't have otherwise? Are you coming in with less money to the table? And if that's the case, the tax should not scare you away from the investment. You should just be aware of it. But really, I think the main thing with it is the tax is a cost of doing business. What you should really look at is your cash, ver your cash on cash return. How much did I put in to get the deal versus how much well, am I getting back to my IRA's net profit? I, I would take that a step further, Nate, and I would go back to my quadrant, right? Mm -hmm. Cash flow, depreciation, amortization, and appreciation, and play that scenario out and say, okay, in 10 years, what are these going to be worth? You just went from 90,000 to 300,000 or more. So in, in 10 years, you appreciated, you know, $210,000 per property, back that back into return on my original $6,000 investment. And, you know, it's crazy. Yeah. So, and, he, and here's kind of how that calculation works. Just, and I, again, I'm not posing it as a CPA. I just want to tell people kind of how it works and how, yeah. how the strategy of leveraging can be, can be ultimately really beneficial, especially if you're buying and holding uh, exactly what Greg was doing. Because when you're looking at buying property that has debt on it, you've got two forms of income that could be taxable. One is your annual income, and that's generated from your rents. But here's the cool thing. When your IRA is in a taxable situation, you can use expenses and depreciation to whittle the tax down, just like we use outside of an IRA. So if your IRA is a taxpayer, get a competent CPA that understands how to fill out this 990T, but it's really just a tax based on your net profit. A lot of times net profit is almost nil. And I think that's basically what Greg just said, the net profit's nil. So you don't have to worry about the tax there on the annual basis. But then the other tax when it comes to real estate is any capital gains. That's not going to kick in until you actually sell the property. And how they, how they look at the, the, the unrelated debt finance income tax or the UDFI tax on that is when you sell the property, if you sell the property, they're only going to look back at your past 12 months of indebtedness. That's what they're going to use to calculate what percentage of the income is taxable to the IRA. Well, here's the beauty part. And I think Greg, I think Greg is, is, is yeah. keen to this. If you hold the property long enough to where the notes paid off and there's no debt and you don't think about selling it until a year after that, well, what's your debt leverage percentage? Oh, it's zero. So how much capital gains tax would you pay if you decide to sell? Zero. No. So you could still use debt to help acquire property and still get to a point to where you pay no capital gains tax on, on the capital gain. Yeah, this, this last December, we sold some properties in our IRA, had a nice gain, and we went and said, you know what? In a year, we might want to sell those properties and re-leverage them. So let's go pay them off now. I'll wait until that year and a day is up. And then I'll decide whether I want to sell those and harvest all of that equity inside my IRA, re-leverage it and push it into something else that's giving me even a better return. Yeah, and your story actually sounds eerily similar, uh, similar to a friend of mine's story uh, who bought a couple properties. It was his first investment in his self-directed IRA and he only had $7,000 in his, in his Roth. Yeah. 
Uh, mm -hmm. What he ended up doing is he found almost a similar situation. He found a, a widow actually who had, you know, kind of took over the management of three warehouse properties that her husband was was managing for, you know, for decades. Uh, unfortunately, he passed away. So, you know, the responsibility of dealing with the tenants and dealing with the maintenance all fell on her. And she was just not comfortable uh, in dealing with the properties, but more, she didn't want to deal with the tenants. Um, she got to a point to where the tenants started kind of taking advantage of her because she wasn't using a property manager. So she just wanted to get out of the investment. She didn't, she didn't need the cash. She just didn't want to deal with the tenants. So uh, uh, my friend, you know, talked to her kind of similar, took her to lunch and said, well, what are your needs? She goes, well, I just, I don't need cash. I just, I just really don't want to deal with, with the tenants. And, and I really want to get this headache out of my way. And he said, well, what if I made an offer to you where I can get you on a monthly basis, what you would probably be getting if you collected the rents from the tenants, but you didn't have to deal with the tenants? Would that be an okay deal for you? And she said, yeah, sure. Um, and, and in order to do that, uh, would you be willing to carry back a note to me, or in this case, my IRA, uh, where I can make payments to you over time? And, and, and again, those would be payments to you. I'll deal with the tenants. You don't have to talk to the tenants ever again. How would that, how would that feel? She said, that would be wonderful. So anyway, anyways, long story short, what he ended up doing is he bought these three warehouse units, all pretty rundown, um, three warehouse units with a $5,000 down payment from the Roth IRA. He kept $2,000 in reserves to pay for a little closing costs and things like that and carried back a note, I think at 9% uh, to the widow and made payments over the course of, I think the next 16 to 18 months. After the 18 months, he found a buyer for one of the warehouses. So his Roth IRA that owns three warehouse units that he acquired by carrying back a note ends up selling one of the warehouse units and sold it for a good enough price that he took all of that profit and you paid don't. off the note to the widow. So really? now what he ends up having is he retained two warehouses that are cash flowing with, rehab with rehabbed tenants and all of the cash is going to his Roth IRA completely tax-free. And all he used was five, actually $7,000 from his Roth IRA. And the two warehouses that he ended up keeping are probably worth about $100,000 today. So with a $7,000 investment, his creativity as a real estate investor, he A, solved the problem for the widow, got her the money she needed and, and eliminated the headache, but also enabled himself to put a, an, an income producing asset in a Roth IRA that'll generate cash flow for decades to come. And everybody walks away happy is the, is the beauty of it. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I think we have some questions here. Uh, Grace, we got some questions. Um, let's see, Robert Hayes, thanks for joining the program, uh, Robert. He says, what do you do if you buy a property and you have to buy, uh, borrow money to buy it? Uh, what's the best way to be educated about the Roth IRA? Um, we've got a couple different questions here. Um, I'll let you take it from your side. What, what would you do on a property that you'd have to borrow uh, money on it in an IRA, Greg? What are your resources that you would use? Well, I would, I would call up NewView and say, what lenders do you have that, that you know your clients have worked with that will give non-recourse loans? And typically that's going to be someplace in the 50 to 65% range um, on, on a leverage standpoint. So um, you're not going to be able to get your 70, 75, 80% uh, range on a, on a, because the deal non-recourse means it has to stand on its own. You can't sign for it. Your good, uh, your good will, your good name, your good credit can't apply to allowing um, that bank to secure that, uh, that line of credit. It's specifically just on the asset or the value of your IRA. That's correct. And, and one of the big ones, if you're looking at institutional lenders, uh, Robert, NASB, which is North American Savings yep. Bank, uh, they're probably one of the biggest national lenders that, that have really targeted that niche of IRA loans. And, and Greg kind of mentioned non-recourse. All non-recourse means in this scenario is that the bank, the lender that's loaning to your IRA doesn't have recourse to you, the individual, because you can't extend your credit 
for uh, towards an asset that's going to be owned in your IRA. So you got to go to a bank that has what's called a non-recourse loan. And when he's talking about percentages, that's typically that that's the down payment that a bank uh, is going to require from the IRA because the IRA doesn't have any credit, doesn't have a FICO score. Your IRA doesn't have income that it can justify in a tax return in most cases. So what do the banks want? Well, it's the it's the third way to qualify. It's equity. How much how much skin in the game uh, do you have? And typically for the bank to feel comfortable since they don't have credit or income is they want at least a 30, 40% down uh, from the, from the IRA. And, and some, some are picky about having it on income producing property, like rental properties, but you might find some that are a little bit more flexible. Greg, you had some. Yeah. And, and Nate, the, the, probably the number one place I would probably look would be new view clients or yeah. other IRA clients looking to put their money to work. Right. And they say, sure, we'll give you that loan. Now, they're, they're probably not going to give you a 20-year loan. They may give you a three-year loan. I, I've, I've borrowed money from, a, from another NewView client for five years. I've given out my money and loaned my money for two years. In fact, I'm doing a deal right now with my nephew in Pennsylvania. Um, he's moving into a house. It's his first house. So I've loaned him money out of my Roth IRA. Now, I cut him a deal. I gave him to him at 8%. Right. And, but he's mm -hmm. going to fix that house. He's going to turn it into a duplex, rent out half of it. And then he'll go back and get a appraisal. And then he'll come back and take me out. And now I've, I've helped him, right, understand all the aspects of real estate and investing and cash flow and getting a tenant and, and helping him through that process and funding that deal for him because probably nobody else would fund him. Right. Right. And so, you know, that's, I, I think, you know, going to the new view events, um, you know, talking to people, um, seeing what, uh, uh, you know, what they have, somebody approaches me, I'm going to look at the deal and say, sure, I've got that money and I'll, I'll loan it to you based on this criteria. Typically, yeah, I'm call that, too. yeah, call that financial friendships, right? You find yes. some financial friends. A, a great way to do that is, is by attending some of the RIAs too. If you're here in central oh, yeah. Florida, you got CFRI, go read. There's a whole list of, of groups that meet. Um, and, and a lot of people have money. That's, that's the best source of financing is, is to attend your local RIA because uh, you don't need to go to banks necessarily for financing, uh, not even for your IRA. An IRA can loan to another IRA. That, that brings me to another point is just the educational side, right? When I started, there wasn't a YouTube, there wasn't podcast, there wasn't, you know, you had to go to a RIA to actually talk to people and, and, and figure out what was going on and, you know, try to learn some things now. It's so, it's great. New View having a podcast like this or YouTube and just researching stuff and pulling it up and being able to, to you know, to, to, to learn that way is, is just tremendous. I probably spend anywhere from 10 to 25% of my annual income on education, right? I want to plow it back in. I want to attend these events. I want to go on these investor cruises. I want to be in a mastermind group. I want to have a mentor. I want to do these things because that's just going to push me, you know, quicker down the road to where I can make bigger, bigger investments, understand different investments. So it's, uh, well, um, I, I think, I think Benjamin Franklin said an investment into knowledge pays the best interest. So yes, by, uh, by far, by uh, we far. got a couple, got a couple other questions. Um, Robert, I know you got a couple questions here. Um, you know, what's the best way to get educated about a Roth IRA? Well, funny you say that. Uh, we're going to talk about the Roth IRA on the 16th. So if you go to our website, uh, make sure to register for that class, that workshop. We're going to be talking at the same time, same place right here. We're going to be talking specifically about the Roth IRA. And um, I want to touch a little bit about uh, what you said here too, Robert, is can I take property that I own and put it in IRA? Unfortunately, that's not something you can do. Be being the IRA owner, uh, you're the fiduciary to your IRA. You have to find it investments, but you can't use it to self-deal with your own property. You can't put your own property in your IRA. Uh, you, and there's other people that are also uh, considered disqualified people to your IRA. Uh, your IRA can't do business with yourself, your spouse, your parents, your grandparents, your kids or grandkids, and their spouses and any companies they own, control, or manage. So it's a specific list of family that have to stay out uh, of the transactional side of the IRA stuff. Greg, you want to add something yeah, to that? So, so, something else we kind of forgot to mention was you can't do any of the work yourself either. Yep. Right? So that's one of the prohibited things that you can't go in and change out the doorknob or, or the kitchen faucet or paint 
or do anything like that because that would be considered a contribution into your IRA and how do you value that? So they just say, no, you can't do that. If you're caught doing that, there's some pretty stiff penalties and I, I would play strictly by the rules. I would not lean, you know, I'm gonna just push this. Just don't push it. It's your IRA money. It's I view it as sacred money. Don't push those rules. Stay well clear of, of that line where you're, you're never gonna be uh, tempted to go over the line or somebody's gonna question whether you did go over the line. Yeah, the best way to think about it is when, when it comes to your IRA, you're the quarterback. You you make you make the call, you make the play calls, but you don't necessarily run the ball or go or or go run into the end zone with it. Uh, making the play calls means you know find out what you want to invest in. But if it's alternative, it's if it's real estate. New View is going to sign all the documents. Uh, you find it. We're not going to sell the property to you, but you find it and then let New View uh, handle the paperwork and sign off on that. And then when I, it I comes say- to Go ahead. Sorry. I, I would say you're more the coach, right? You're on the yep. sideline calling the plays, telling the Even quarterback, better. here's the play to run. And yep. Yep. You're the coach. And same thing with, ex, you know, expenses and doing the rehab, finding somebody who is a non-disqualified third party, be it a contractor, uh, you know, somebody that's not on that people's list that I mentioned, any of them can, can fix up the property or, or do the, the rehab, do the paint, uh, but just make sure it's not you doing that as well. Uh, Patricia, you got a question that's kind of similar. Can, can you loan your IRA to, uh, for fix up expenses? The answer is yes, as long as it's not to you personally. Uh, or any to, to any other disqualified person or disqualified person's IRA. So uh, if I have my IRA sitting here, and for instance, uh, Greg's got a deal and he's just looking for some short-term you know, financing for some expenses, could I loan my IRA to him? Well, yeah, because he's not a disqualified person to me. Could I loan my IRA to myself on a deal I'm doing? No, unfortunately, I can't do that. Uh, anytime I want to take a benefit from my personal benefit from my IRA, I have to take it as a distribution. I can't tell my IRA to make a loan uh, to me. Um, so John says, how did he loan it, this? And this is a good one. So I'll let you answer this. How did he loan to his nephew if relatives are not permitted? Because it's not a blood relative. It's my sister's son. And he is not a disqualified individual. So my sister is not a disqualified individual. My children my parents, my grandparents, my grandchildren are all disqualified individuals, but it's only follows the linear bloodline. Yep. So in the IRS code, the, the disqualified people include, typically it's the people that would most likely inherit your IRA. And that's usually going to be spouse and your dependents, kids, grandkids, all the way down. Right. So in the code, they disqualify those people, regardless of who, if you put them on their, your beneficiary form or not. It's always going to be spouse up the line with parents and grandparents down the line with kids and grandkids, family to the side, siblings, cousins, aunts, uncles, nieces, nephews. They're not on the disqualified person's list. So your IRA could do business with those individuals if you chose to. So uh, anything you want to add to that, Greg? No, I just, I, I before, before we, uh, we closed out, I wanted to, I put together a little chart. And for those people just getting started, right? And they say, well, I don't have that much. I don't know what to put in. I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to wait until this deal comes along. I'd say that's the wrong thinking. I'd say you need to start contributing as quickly as you can. And so I kind of put some some facts and figures together. So based on a 10% return, Nate, if you're 20 years old, if you put in $18 a week, every week, $18, what is that? How many uh, how many Starbucks is that? Um, One. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and, and you do that for, you've got 47 years uh, to retirement. Well, 20, what is that? Yeah. 20, help me with my math here, Nate, 39 years, yep. right? So, yep. so if you do that with a 10% return, when you retire, you'll have a million dollars in your, in your retirement fund by putting in $18 a week. If you're 30 years old, now it's going to take a bit more. You got to put in $49.52 a week or $214.60 a month to have that same million dollars. A 40 year old, right now you've only got 19 years left uh, or before you hit that 59 and a half. Um, well, actually I, I put I put retirement at 67 because I figure people are yeah. living longer. Yeah. So I, I did it to 67. So 40 years, you got 27 years, you got to put $140 a week in. 50 year old, you got to put in $433. 
and 60 year old, you got to put in $1,907. Yeah. So it's, it gets harder. It gets harder as you get older. Um, hey, Greg, uh, there's a couple questions about what is CFRI. And I know you kind of mentioned you've got another uh, class that may be coming up. Uh, where, where can people get more information, you know, from you? Yeah, they can go to um, the CFR website if they specifically want CFRI. It's CFRI.net. And uh, they'll have a list. It, it does cost $125 to join, but there's a lot of classes, a lot of education, a lot of very knowledgeable individuals that are willing to share there. So I would say that, uh, you know, that would be by far a, a great investment in your, in your education. Um, if somebody wants to contact me directly, um, I will, I'll give you my personal uh, 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 email address, and that's Greg, G-R-E-G, -E last name Bond, B-O-N-D, the number seven at me.com. So Greg Bond seven at me.com. Awesome. Um, we've got a couple of questions and I actually, Grace, if you can pull up the slide just to go to the end. Yeah. If you guys have any questions about self-directed IRAs and Janet, I see you've got a Vanguard IRA and you might want to think about moving it over. Um, I want ever to encourage everybody to email uh, this email, which is, sorry, let me get back here, is uh, IRA specialists at newviewtrust.com. That goes to not only myself, but it goes to my IRA specialist team. There's four of us here uh, that can answer your questions and get you started uh, on your road to self-directing. Um, the process is really simple. Uh, the first step just involves filling out an application for an IRA, choosing what type of IRA you want, whether that's traditional, Roth, or otherwise. Um, getting the account funded, which we help walk you through that piece. So that's really cut and dry. Getting the application started, getting it funded from a, you know, a transfer from another IRA or rolling it over from an old 401k. And then once the account is open and funded, that's where you come into play and tell us what you want to invest in. I would highly encourage, encourage anybody to reach out to our IRA specialists prior to making an investment so we can kind of walk you through the process and the things, the types of documents uh, that we need. Um, but that's the email that you can uh, reach out to to get immediately immediate help if you want to get started. Uh, and is it spelled right? Specialist? Yes, that's how it is on the screen. Specialist with an S, uh, John. So reach out to us. And I tell you what, uh, might as well throw out this, uh, which is our promo for the month. If you're interested in opening up multiple accounts, maybe it's one for yourself, one for your spouse, or just one for another loved one, whether it's children or grandchildren or otherwise, uh, we're doing a special month, uh, February, since February is uh, the month of Valentine's. Uh, if you open an account, we'll give you another one with no application cost, uh, nice. and that's unlimited. So if you want to open up multiple accounts, just open one, pay a $50 application fee, and we'll let you open as many as you want after that with no application fee. And if you want to stay up to date with New View, uh, scan that QR code. Uh, that'll take you to our YouTube channel, our Facebook page. Uh, and I really hope that this uh, you know, brief uh, conversation with Greg Bond helped everybody out there uh, talking directly from a client's perspective. Uh, he's here. He's around in Central Florida. Uh, check out CFRI. It's the largest uh, REI, a Real Estate Investor Association in Central Florida. Great place for education. Greg, I, I want to thank you for joining us today. Any, any final thoughts for, for our listeners you know, I, today? I just want to encourage you know, any, any listeners that are on the fence, just, just try it, right? Just, just jump in. If you don't know what you want to invest in, you can invest in what you're investing in right now in your non-self-directed account. So move it to New View, get it ready to invest in something else. But if you don't know what you want to do right now, just invest it in exactly what you're investing in right now, which is, which is possible within New View. So, and then it's there, it's ready for you to utilize. Awesome, keep, awesome advice. Just, you know, just do it. Um, it's one of those things where once you learn it and once you go through the first investment, I've just seen so many clients say that was not that hard. Uh, and then they continue to just continue to invest in the investments that they're knowledgeable about. And that's what we're here for. So if anybody has anything else, uh, you know, just email us at IRA specialist at newviewtrust.com. Uh, thank you for everybody saying thank you. Thank you again, Greg. We'll see you soon. Uh, and we'll keep in touch again. Remember next Wednesday, we'll be doing our next Wednesday workshop. And I believe we have Tom Barry on Tom Barry talking about due diligence. So make okay. sure to attend Tom Barry's a great guy. Uh, and you're going to learn a lot from him as well. So thank you again, Greg. And thank you everybody for attending. Thank you.